Hello everyone. My name is Archana Venkatraman and I am a John C. Malone Assistant Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. Today I am pleased to present Foundations of Bayesian Learning. This lecture is part of the ABCD NEPRO-RIM educational course. So as motivation for this course, we can recognize that the world around us is quite uncertain. So for example, there's a tremendous variability in weather patterns. And in fact, this is, is quite random. So a priori, there's potentially a range of possible temperatures on the next day, same for humidity um, and precipitation. And so somehow weather forecasters need to parse this information to provide a prediction for us for the next day. Likewise, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in, in the medical sphere as well. So for example, we don't really know with 100% guarantees whether or not a particular treatment will work on a patient, whether it will cause side effects, whether we should be uh, doing something else in terms of helping cure a particular illness, etc. Another area of randomness is human behavior. So um, based on our interactions with other people, we might have some guesses as to how a person might behave in a certain situation, but of course it's person dependent. And so from our point of view, there's a, some amount of uncertainty in terms of the future response. And finally, going back to the neuro domain, the brain's response to external stimuli is also something that has some randomness. So for example, we can use fMRI to get a rough idea about what regions of the brain might activate in response to a stimulus. But of course, this is highly variable across subjects. And so for a new subject, we cannot say with 100% certainty which parts of the brain will activate and to what extent. So all of these observations lead us to the heart of the course, which is probability. And effectively, the rules of probability help us to quantify uncertainty that we can encounter in many domains. And they allow us to make predictions about unknown phenomenon. So for example, the weather next day or someone's behavior with in, in a new situation based on their probabilistic relationships to known quantities. So here is an outline for this course. So the course is divided into four modules and then a wrap up of main takeaway. So the first three modules will introduce um, basic concepts and estimation frameworks that are used uh, quite often in the literature. And then the last module is a kind of a working example involving neuroimaging. And just as a warning, in this course, I'm going to introduce quite a bit of mathematical notation involving probabilities and distributions and different frameworks. And the reason for this is to provide an introduction to concepts that you might see if you read papers in statistics or machine learning, and as a way of trying to uh, formalize some of the intuition that we already have associated with probability. So let's start with the fundamentals. So the building block for our treatment of Bayesian learning is called a random variable. And so a random variable is a kind of a quantitative measure, so it's a numerical value, that is dependent on some underlying random experiment. So this is a very broad and vague definition, but hopefully it will become more crystallized as we move through. Now these random variables, and in this case the random variable is x, depend on some underlying probability distribution. And so the notation that you see on the slide is the random variable x and the tilde means is distributed as, and then the probability has a subscript to denote the random variable of interest, and then an argument, which is the actual value of this random variable that we might observe. So random variables come in two flavors, depending on the types of observations that we can make. So the first category are called discrete random variables. So here, x can take on one of a finite set of values. And so the notation is the, the probability distribution of this discrete random variable. It's just equal to the probability of observing each of those outcomes. <laughs> 
So the simplest example of a discrete random variable is known as a Bernoulli. Uh, so here the values it can assume are just 0 or 1 um, in the basic case with some probability of, of each value occurring. And so we can think of a Bernoulli random variable conceptually as tossing a coin. Right, so there's only two outcomes when you toss a coin. It can either be heads or tails, and we can assign heads and tails to some numerical value and actually kind of simulate this experiment. So a generalization of the Bernoulli random variable is called a multinomial distribution. So in this case, we can observe one of k uh, possible values where k is just dependent on the underlying characteristics of our data. So we can think of it conceptually as rolling a dice. So if we roll a dice, we have one of six possible outcomes, which is the face up that we observe, which leads to six entries or six possible values for our multinomial random variable. Likewise, if we roll two dice, then each one has six possible outcomes. So if we consider the dice together, there are 36 possible outcomes. And so now our multinomial random variable, if we're going to log both dice values uh, simultaneously, would have 36 entries. So k would be 36. Now the second category of random variables are continuous. So in this case, that measurement x has some real value. So for example, if we're going to log temperatures, just walk outside and log temperatures every day, it's a continuous value because we can have kind of decimals and we can log temperatures to different precisions. And so in this case, um, the random variable, the probability formulation is a little bit more complicated. Um, and so it's kind of based on what's known as a cumulative distribution. And this um, distribution, little px, captures the rate of change of that cumulative distribution. So once again, this is fairly abstract. So let's look at some examples that you might have seen in other scenarios or potentially in your research. The most common uh, distribution that we encounter in statistics is known as a Gaussian or a normal distribution. So this is the very canonical bell-shaped curve. And so the normal or Gaussian distribution has two parameters. So the first is this, the mean, or mu in this case, which is kind of the center of that mass. And the other is the standard deviation or sigma, which is the spread of the points around the mean. And so this mean and standard deviation are just going to depend on the particular data that you're measuring. So for example, if we're collecting temperatures and we're conducting this experiment in the desert in that geography summertime, our mean is going to be quite high, maybe in the 90s, 80s and 90s, versus if we're going to conduct this experiment in the middle of Alaska in the wintertime, our mean is now going to shift downwards, um, maybe below, uh, below zero or below freezing. Right? And likewise, if we are considering our experiment of measuring temperatures and we're conducting it for the entire year, we're going to have a much higher variability of those temperature readings than if we're conducting it in just one month or one season where there's much less variability. So another distribution that you might encounter is known as a uniform distribution. So here, the, um, the underlying assumption is that we can only observe these random variables in a finite interval. But within that interval, the random variable can be continuous or have, have infinite precision. So the salient parameters of this distribution are just the starting and stopping point of that interval. And we assume that all points in between are equally likely to be observed. Okay, so now that we've introduced the idea of random variables in more of an abstract sense, let's actually consider what that means for the data. So effectively, in most scenarios, we're just collecting data. So what is the relationship between the data that we might observe and that distribution that captures the probability that we would use for kind of downstream learning? So let's consider a random, uh, the simpler case of a discrete random variable, and we'll consider just the Bernoulli case where there's two possible outcomes. 
So, uh, so a zero and a one, right? Well, we can conceptually map this into the idea of a coin toss. So in, in the case of a fair coin, we have equally likely chances of obtaining a head or a tail, right? So let's map heads onto the value zero and tails onto the value one. And let's consider if we're just collecting data by tossing a coin over and over and over and over, what would it look like? So in the case where the each of uh, the zero and the one have equal probability, like a fair coin, if we toss it over and over, we'd expect roughly similar numbers of heads and tails. So this corresponds to a data stream where there's approximately equal number of ones and zeros, right? And so now we can even work backwards. So given a string of ones and zeros that might have been sampled from some experiment, well, we can group them and compute the probability of zero and probability of one and map that back into the Bernoulli distribution itself. Now, similarly, let's focus on a Gaussian distribution. So remember, there is a mean and a standard deviation. So let's consider a, kind of an experiment in which we are going to go around to university classrooms and randomly pick individuals and ask them for their age and record it, right? So in this case, what, what would our data look like? And so here I'd argue that, well, we have a very high likelihood of sampling students who kind of have an age range maybe between 20 and 25. So that'll be fairly likely. But we also have the sort of an ability to sample outside that. So we might encounter instructors that are on the younger side, so junior professors. So that'll be close to the student age, but still a little bit separate. There might be some senior faculty, so there's even more extension of that possible age. And likewise, we might have um, sort of undergra undergraduates, high school students walking around. Maybe there is a summer program where there's uh, younger students walking around campus. And so in that case, we'd again expect to receive data where there's a clustering around kind of college age and then sort of distributed points outside that range. And so the mapping is, if we look at the histogram of values, it'll start looking a little bit like that bell shape or that normal distribution. And so now your TAs will help you with an exercise which considers sampling from a uniform distribution and using those samples to reconstruct kind of the mathematical formulation. Now that we've introduced the idea of a random variable and shown some correspondence with, between the probability distribution and data that we might um, observe or expect to see from that probability distribution, we can circle back to kind of the, the fundamental question we're trying to answer in this course, which is how do we make a prediction about an unknown quantity given a known quantity that's observable? And really, the underlying uh, infrastructure that allows us to be able to do that is kind of the idea of a joint distribution, meaning we have two random variables and there's some relationship between the two of them, of course, in a statistical sense. But because there is that relationship, we can use the information about one to at least narrow down or the distribution of the other. So as an example, Let's consider a modification of that college classroom experiment. And here we're going to go into different college classrooms and just measure people's heights and then sort of come back, record them and come back. Well, suppose that we also want to know their weight, but we just forgot to record it. But it turns out there is some relationship between height and weight. So Roughly speaking, the shorter someone is, in general, the less they tend to weigh, and the taller someone is, in general, the more they tend to weigh. So just based on the fact that we've observed and recorded the height, we have a much narrower range about the weight we expect that individual to have. And so that relationship is what allows us to learn. And formally, our learning is going to be based on a conditional distribution. So this uh, conditional distribution is the probability of one random variable given a fixed value of the other random variable. 
So let's just plot a cartoonish example. So suppose we're interested in heights and weights. So the x-axis, so the random variable x corresponds to height, and then the y-axis, or random variable y, corresponds to weight. So here I've drawn what's called a, a domain of the joint distribution. So this is the region of the space where we expect non-zero probability. And so it kind of maps to the height-weight problem because as x increases, so does the domain of y. So our conditional distribution, px given y, or the probability of the random variable x given a fixed value of the random variable y, is basically like taking a slice through that joint distribution and then normalizing it, because one of the rules of probability is that it should integrate to 1. Finally, one important property is the idea of statistical independence. And so statistical independence um, formally, mathematically speaking, means that the joint distribution of two random variables factorizes into the product of the marginal distributions, or alternatively, the conditional distribution of x given y is just equal to the original distribution of the random variable x. Now, practically speaking, from the point of view of this lecture, what it means is that when two random variables are independent, we actually can't do any learning because knowing something about the random variable y doesn't actually tell us anything additional about the random variable x and vice versa. So to practice these concepts, the TAs have prepared an exercise on tilted Gaussians just to um, sort of practice plotting joint distributions and understanding what the conditional distribution means and how it can change based on the parameters. And finally, all of those mathematics brings us to the heart of the course, which is Bayes' rule. And so in Bayes' rule, it's, um, we're trying to compute what's called a posterior distribution. So it's just one, it's a conditional distribution, so px given y, but the quantities x and y have very specific meanings. So in this case, x is some sort of hidden random variable, so this is something we don't observe or it's unknown, and we want to make a prediction about it. And then y is our observed data, so these are measurements that we can go out and collect. Um, to try and make that prediction. And so Bayes' rule basically says that this conditional distribution, this posterior, is equal to the ratio of two probabilities. So in the numerator, we actually have a factorization of the joint distribution between x and y that uh, consists of a prior term, which is just the distribution of x, um, and then a likelihood, which is like an opposite conditional relationship as the posterior. And so this is actually quite useful because often we have, through some statistical characterization or clinical hypotheses or um, sort of model assumptions, we have some knowledge of the prior and likelihood. So for example, let's consider an experiment where we're going out into the ocean and catching fish and suppose we record the length of the fish, y, but we forget to take the weight. Well, similar to kind of sampling um, individuals in a college classroom, there is still a relationship between the length and the weight. And so a priori, we might have some statistics about what the weight of fish in that particular reg region of the ocean should be. And so that's like our prior. And then likewise, we might have some information about given a particular weight, what are the, length, the ranges of lengths that we might observe in the fish? And so that's the likelihood. And then finally, the denominator is called a partition function. So this is actually just the probability of y, which once again, we can factorize and use this marginalization trick um, to compute. So often this partition function, because of that integration, is difficult to compute. And so as an exercise, uh, your TAs have prepared a kind of a scenario with a joint distribution and computing actually this partition function and the posterior. So it, it turns out because in Bayes' rule we have this contribution of a prior and a likelihood, there's actually a trade-off, which we'll see in later in the course. It sort of corresponds to the trade-off between our a priori model assumptions and then the data that we actually observe. And so just as a very uh, basic illustration of this prior likelihood trade-off, let's consider a medical example where we have a very rare disease, 
Um, and we are trying to determine whether a particular test that's been developed by the pharmaceutical industry is a good test. So our, our given information is that our test for the rare disease has a sensitivity and specificity of 95% or 0.95, and that the incidence of the disease is 0.001, so it's a very rare disease. And then we want to try and understand, is this a good test to be deployed in the public? Well, so let's actually translate this information into random variables in mathematics. And so let's, uh, so in this case, we have two particular random quantities. The first is the disease status of the patient. So, and here, this is just a generalization of the Bernoulli. So instead of zero, one, I've just assumed negative one and one for negative and positive. So either the person doesn't have the disease or they do have the disease. And likewise, the second random variable is the outcome of the test. And so that can either be positive or negative also. So I've just denoted them as minus one and plus one. So we are then given that the sensitivity and specificity are 95%. And so what this means is that um, if someone has the disease, then the probability that the test is positive is 95% or 0.95, so that's the first equation. And then the analogous uh, flip is um, that if someone does not have the disease, then the test turns out negative 95% of the time or 0.95. So this is the second equation. So these, um, these kind of two components are like the likelihood model right and so then we can consider is this a good test so in order to to sort of make that assessment what we want to know is suppose i gave it to an, a sort of a, a random person with unknown status and it turned out positive what is the probability that that individual actually has the disease and so from the mathematical point of view it's um, the distribution we're after is the probability of d given t and then that D is positive and T is positive. So by Bayes' rule, we can actually write this as sort of a ratio of two probabilities. And on the numerator, we have the prior, which is the probability of the disease, of the person having the disease, which is the incidence in the population, times the likelihood, which is the probability of the test given the disease, um, which we had computed as 0.95. And then the denominator is actually um, the probability of the test being positive regardless of disease status and so we can factorize that as the probability of that the person has the disease times the probability the test is positive given the person has the disease plus the probability that the person doesn't have the disease times the probability that the test is positive even though that person doesn't have a disease and if we plug in all of the numbers that were given in the problem statement what we obtain is that this test is sort of gives us the correct disease status only about 2% of the time, meaning it's actually a really poor test to be deployed in the population. And so the question is, what's happening here? And it turns out that the disease is so rare, so the disease incidence rate is 0.001, that even minor errors in that test, so even that 5% error, just make it useless because it's kind of overwhelms the disease incidence. And so this is again a trade-off between the prior, which is that incidence, and then the likelihood, which is the goodness of the test. So with some of the fundamentals now built up, including our use of Bayes rule, we can tackle the first learning framework, which is hypothesis testing. So the setup of hypothesis testing um, has two random variables. So there is H and there is Y. So formally, the random variable H corresponds to un some unknown state of the world. So you might have seen it in other scenarios being called the null and alternative hypotheses. And then Y is just the observed data that we have in our problem. So this could be real world measurements that we go and take. So the goal of hypothesis testing is to use the probabilistic relationships between the unknown state H and the observed data Y to construct a decision rule. Now this decision rule is a function that produces a guess of the hypothesis, which we denote as H hat, where the hat means a guess or an estimate, given every observation in our domain. 
So effectively, these decision rules are going to partition our observation space. So just pictorially, suppose we're collecting a single measurement, little y here. So maybe the, um, the age of, of particular subjects. So a decision rule actually specifies intervals in this, in this domain y where we would declare or we would guess a hypothesis H1, so the alternative hypothesis, and then other intervals where we might declare or guess the um, null hypothesis H0. So likewise, if we have more than one measurement, so here uh, we have y1 and y2 being two separate measurements, so maybe y1 is age and y2 is IQ. Now our decision rules are areas in this space, so they're slightly more complicated. And then likewise, if we have more and more and more measurements, it's like a higher dimensional space which we are partitioning to um, produce regions where we guess the null hypothesis and regions where we guess the alternative hypothesis. Now, mathematically, we can construct these decision rules through a likelihood ratio test. And so this is a procedure that combines the prior and likelihood information. So mathematically, we have two portions. So we have the prior, which is the probability of the null hypothesis, P0, and the probability of the alternative hypothesis, P1. Uh, so in the medical example earlier, this could be the incidence rate of the disease. Then the second portion is the likelihood model. So what is the distribution of the data given the null hypothesis and the distribution of data given the alternative hypothesis? And then, so our goal is to try and minimize the probability of error. And so this boils down to comparing the posterior distributions of H. So this is a little bit of a notation, but just parsing it uh, sort of very quickly, so on the left, I have the conditional distribution or the posterior of the alternative hypothesis given the data. And then on the right, we have the posterior of the null hypothesis given the data. And so the, the little arrows in the middle are saying that if the left-hand side is greater than the right-hand side, we should guess H1. And this makes intuitive sense because effectively we have the posterior of H1 is greater than the posterior of H0. And likewise, if the right-hand side is bigger than the left-hand side, we'll guess the null hypothesis H0. And then we can actually substitute all of these different rules from the Bayes rule slide and massage this into a form that's actually much easier for us to compute because it relies on quantities in our problem statement. So on the right-hand side, we actually just have the ratio of the two likelihood functions. So this is the distribution of the data given on the numerator, the alternative hypothesis divided by um, and then the denominator, the sort of the conditional distribution given the null hypothesis. And then we're just going to compare that ratio to the ratio of the priors. So the probability of the null hypothesis on the numerator and the probability of the alternative hypothesis on the denominator. And so this very simple test will give us for any possible observation y, what should we guess for the unknown state h. Now with this likelihood ratio test, we can start to understand how do the probability distributions and this decision rule relate to sensitivity and specificity, which are often quantities that we'd like to characterize in our problem. So I've just drawn a very simple example where um, the observed data is Gaussian. And so under the null hypothesis, that Gaussian has a smaller mean. And under the alternative hypothesis, the Gaussian has a higher mean. And so these are represented by the purple and the green curves, respectively. Now, in the case where the priors are equal, uh, so the hypotheses are equally likely to occur, um, based on our likelihood ratio test, the decision rule is actually at the intersection of the two curves, meaning to the right of that intersection, we are going to guess H1, so the alternative hypothesis, and to the left, we're going to guess H0, or the null hypothesis. Now, in this setting, sensitivity is what is the probability that H1 did happen, so the alternative hypothesis did happen, given that I guessed H1. And so from these two distributions, that sensitivity would be the integration under the green curve 
um, to the right of that dividing line. And so I plotted that uh, as sort of the first orange point. And uh, also the specificity is kind of the opposite relationship. And often we are interested in one minus specificity or the false alarm rate. And so the false alarm rate is effectively, what is the probability that I falsely declared the alternative hypothesis um, given that it was actually the null hypothesis that occurred. So this is a false positive rate. And so in this figure, that would be the area under the purple curve, again, to the right of that dividing line. And so that corresponds to the kind of the orange point on the slide here. Now, suppose that the alternative hypothesis was actually more likely to occur than the null hypothesis. We could visualize this by increasing the size of that green curve relative to the purple curve. And once again, our likelihood ratio test will now be at the intersection of the two new curves, which is a little bit to the left of the original point. And this makes sense because if, if we believe that alternative hypothesis is more likely to occur, then we'll jump the gun a little bit. So even if the underlying sort of probability distributions are a little off balance, we're more likely to declare the alternative hypothesis. So now if we compute sensitivity and specificity, what we see is that the integration under the green curve will be larger because we're actually integrating more area, and so will the integration under the purple curve. And so both sensitivity and specificity will increase, or sensitivity and false positive rate will increase, I'm sorry. And similarly, now if the probability of the null hypothesis is larger than that of the alternative hypothesis, this amounts to the opposite reweighting. So we now increase the size of the purple curve relative to the green curve, and our new decision rule is actually to the right of the original decision rule. Um, and so this also makes sense. So if we have strong belief that the null hypothesis is true, so for example, if the disease is very, very rare, so most people are actually healthy, then we're going to become much more conservative about declaring that a disease, someone has a disease, right? And so likewise, if we look at sensitivity and specificity, or sensitivity and one minus specificity, so the false positive rate, we see that they both decrease. And so kind of by sweeping this relationship, we can construct effectively a receiver operating characteristic or an ROC curve. And that's really the curve that captures kind of the performance characterization of the problems uh, of this hypothesis testing problem based on your two likelihood distributions. And so the TAs have provide, prepared an exercise to kind of practice the sensitivity and specificity and likelihood ratio tests um, in the case where now you're shifting your data distributions rather than just increasing and decreasing the size. So this hypothesis testing or kind of discrete setup for the unknown state actually forms the basis for many machine learning extensions. And these include Emory or kind of more complex hypothesis testing, where instead of just a binary uh, possible scenarios, we have multiple cases that could occur. Um, going one step further, kind of this discrete unknown state is also the basis for clustering models. So for example, if we want to automatically subtype different patients based on observed uh, clinical manifestations, this often amounts to a clustering problem. So the idea of also a discrete unknown quantity forms the backbone for classification models. So the simplest classification model is a logistic regression, and then we can take it all the way in complexity to deep neural networks, which use kind of learned weights and interactions, again, for the purposes of classifying or obtaining some information about an unknown state given the data. So now let's turn to our second framework, which is parameter estimation. So parameter estimation, we have the same basic setup where we have um, two random variables. One is hidden, meaning it's unknown to us, and the other is observed, meaning it's data that we can go out and collect. So we have a slight change of notation. So now our hidden parameter is going to be called x instead of h. And um, the difference is that x is now continuous. So it could be age, um, it could be weight, or some measurement that we 
that we can't directly obtain, but we'd like to estimate. And then once again, we have y corresponding to our observed data. So similar to hypothesis testing, where we are looking at decision rules, the goal of parameter estimation is to construct an estimator. So this is a function that produces a best guess of that unknown parameter, and we call it x hat because we are using hat to denote an estimate or a guess, um, given an observation y. So unlike the case of hypothesis testing where these decision rules partitioned our space, um, the goal, parameter estimation can be thought much more like a regression problem. So we'd like to obtain a function that effectively maps out trends in this joint distribution so that given any value of our known quantity, we can output a best guess or some information about that unknown quantity. So going into the formulation, once again, we have two pieces of information. That's our prior. So this is without any data. What are the statistics of that unknown parameter? And then we have our likelihood, which is kind of what is the data look like given possible hidden values of that parameter? So formally, the prior is P of X and the likelihood is P of Y given X. Now, our optimization here is to minimize the mean squared error. So it's kind of the weighted average of the error between the true parameter value and our estimate across um, the joint distribution of x and y. So this is the, uh, this is the analogy to um, kind of minimizing the error of our prediction in the hypothesis testing scenario. So substituting in some mathematics, um, we can show that our, our estimator is actually based on the posterior distribution from Bayes' rule, or Px given y. And remember, this posterior kind of weighs the influence of the prior belief x and then our observed data y. And so with, uh, through the derivation, we can show that the optimal guess, so our estimator x hat of y, is equal to the mean value of our posterior distribution. So let's take a look at a simple example based on Gaussian distributions. So here we have the unknown random variable x, and then we're going to obtain measurements through of y, which are related to x via this noisy linear transformation. right? Um, so in this case, the unknown random variable x has a prior distribution shown in blue. So this is a Gaussian centered at 0.4. And then the generative process is somehow um, we're going to sample a value from this distribution and then use that to generate all the y's that we observe. Now, in general, this distribution says that we should be sampling values closer to 0.4, but we don't know what it is, and that's what we're going to use the observed data to find out. So in this particular example, we've actually sampled um, something near the tail of the distribution, so a value of 0.6. And so let's look at how our estimator changes as we observe data. So we first, uh, so first the kind of the likelihood that we're going to sample from is this yellow curve. So given that value of 0.6, then our y's are kind of distributed around that mean value of x. And so now let's consider just observing data um, that's kind of sampled from this distribution. So the first data point that we observe is that yellow stick. So it's near the mean value of 0.6. And so now if we're going to produce an estimator of x, we have kind of a trade-off. So our prior, so that blue curve, is telling us that we should be closer to 0.4, but then our data sample is telling us that really we should be higher than that. And so those two combine to form that first guess, which is the dark orange stick, um, around 0.52 or 5, 0.53. Now we'll continue to sample y, and our second sample, the second yellow stick, is actually close to our original or current estimator for x, and so we don't really move that much. But as we sample more values from y, which is the from the yellow distribution, remember that our data, it's almost like the, the points, if we look at the data, the histogram of those points will match the distribution. 
And so over time, we're getting more and more data that eventually tells us that the optimal estimator for x is actually close to that true value of 0.6. And so in this case, what's happened is that we're getting more and more and more data, and that data is kind of overwhelming the influence of our prior distribution and guiding us towards that true, measure, that true um, unknown quantity. Now, the idea of parameter estimation is actually found in many, many different frameworks. So it provides a backbone for hierarchical graphical models, for a time series analysis, for causal mediation analysis. We can use some of these principles for uncertainty quantification. And finally, deep neural networks, the underlying um, optimization procedure is geared towards estimating these unknown quantities as well. So in the final module, I want to go through a working example of building these Bayesian relationships with both continuous and discrete random variables in the context of functional connectivity. So as background, uh, functional MRI or fMRI is used to measure the brain dynamics. So it's effectively a 4D acquisition with a relatively high spatial resolution between 2 and 5 millimeters cubed, um, but a fairly slow sampling rate, so between 2 and 5 seconds. So as you can see on the slide, we can think of fMRI as a collection of volumes over time, where alternatively each spatial location has an associated time course. So functional connectivity relies on a resting state protocol, which is collected in the absence of any experimental stimulus. And it's believed that temporal correlations within these signals reflect the intrinsic functional organization of the brain. So from the uh, data standpoint, what we are interested in are these correlation measures, rho i, j, between the data at spatial location i and spatial location j. So these correlation measures can be used to map out different functional subsystems in the brain. So here I've illustrated the motor, default, and visual subnetworks that were identified by high correlations in this resting state data. And we can also aggregate these pairwise correlation measures into a whole brain functional connectivity uh, matrix for downstream analyses. So now that we understand the data, let's actually turn to the model. So how we specify the random variables and probabilistic interactions. So the overall goal of this framework is to identify subnetworks in this functional connectivity data that are different or are affected by a particular neuropsychiatric disorder. So we have two populations in this data set. So let's start with the healthy or neurotypical control population. So here, we're going to assume that there's a latent functional template um, corresponding to the variables f, i, j. Um, so f, i, j denotes the sort of latent functional connectivity between regions i and j in the brain, and it's unobserved, so we cannot measure it directly. Now, formally, this fij is a tri-state random variable. So this is a slight extension to the Bernoulli that we played around with. And the three states correspond to negative functional synchrony, no coactivation, and positive functional synchrony. So mathematically, it's distributed as a multinomial distribution with some unknown parameters pi f. So our observations, so what we can actually measure in this problem, are these correlations from the previous slide. And here we've denoted these correlations as B, I, J. So we assume that the, um, the observed data B, can, sort of that likelihood is Gaussian, but that the sort of position, so the mean and the variance of this Gaussian are going to depend on the underlying functional connectivity. So for example, if their uh, sort of the latent functional template is uh, negative, then we expect a lower mean. And then likewise, as we go, as if the latent template says there's no synchrony between the region, the mean is slightly higher, 
And finally, if there's positive synchrony between the regions, we have an even higher mean. So now that we have kind of the model for the control population, let's turn to how we're extracting these atypical subnetworks. So we're going to assume that these subnetworks are um, characterized by a set of foci. So these are like centers of abnormal connectivity in the brain or hubs of abnormal connectivity. And so these, again, they correspond to these latent regions denoted by the labels R, which we can't observe directly because we can't say we don't have ground truth information about which regions are affected, but we'd like to estimate that from the data or infer it from the data. So formally, the region label R for each region I um, consists, can take on one of K plus one states. So it can either be zero, denoting it's healthy, so it's unaffected, or it's one through K, denoting it belongs to one of the K abnormal subnetworks. So mathematically, again, this random variable Ri is distributed as a multinomial random variable with some other parameters pi r. So we then specify from the healthy template and these foci kind of a, a graph of atypical connectivity in that clinical population of patients. And so the probabilistic interactions really capture a, almost a spreading pattern where these region foci act as hubs and abnormal uh, edges propagate outwards from them. And then finally, our observations for the clinical group are once again these correlation matrices from the resting state fMRI data. So just to hammer the point home, all we observe are these correlation matrices. And from there, we can use these probabilistic relationships to obtain um, the information, so posterior probability or estimates of these unknown states, um, so the Fs and the Rs. So we've applied this model to several different data sets, but just as an example, um, let's consider uh, uh, an application of this model to the ABIDE data set to look at differences in autism. So here are the subnetworks estimated by our framework, this hierarchical Bayesian framework. And what we can see is if we just do a naive um, pairwise t-test on these functional edges, we get very distributed patterns across the brain, whereas in our model, kind of these, these prior assumptions help us consolidate that information to a few region hubs, which we can then interpret and then focus on or target for downstream therapeutics or future studies. Now, we can take that same core model that I described and just change the probabilistic interactions a little bit. And so instead of hubs, we can now look at atypical clusters or communities in the brain. So once again, we've applied this to autism to identify hypoactive and hyperactive clusters. We can also integrate the functional connectivity information with anatomical information from diffusion MRI. So we've applied this to schizophrenia. And then finally, we can collapse some of the random variables and look at patient-specific network differences, which we've applied to epilepsy. So all of these um, endeavors were done just by changing some of the probability distributions of the hierarchical model, which really illustrates the flexibility and power of Bayesian machine learning approaches. Now, before wrapping up, I'd just like to take a moment to thank my fantastic lab, our collaborators, and our funding sources. So the main takeaways from this course are that Bayesian methods use relationships between random variables to infer unknown quantities based on observed data. So discrete problems in this space are related to hypothesis testing, and the extensions of these include clustering and Bayesian classification methods. Now, continuous problems boil down to a parameter estimation framework, and then more complicated models can be done and developed by incorporating hierarchical information. And finally, if there's one takeaway, it's that the posterior distribution, so the posterior distribution is the probability of the unknown quantities given the observed quantities, that's really the key for all of the subsequent inference. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about the material. Thank you.